Hello everybody, we've got a dual camera set up going on again, Instagram and Facebook. So if you're on Instagram, let me know that you're here from Instagram, and if you're from Facebook, let me know you're here from Facebook. Let me know who you are, let me know. Let me this is this is a part two. So let me know if you saw part one, because I know part one was incredibly popular. I had I got so many messages from it, it was it was really great. So if you've seen the part one of this, let me know. I'm gonna do a little a little recap in, in just a minute so that Anybody that missed it kind of has some context for what we're talking about, but we're going to talk about the, the second part of this. So we're talking about the kill it, starve it model, and this is kind of like what most traditional, like even like the alternative practitioners kind of do this. This is sort of the model that's generally accepted, but a lot of people see it doesn't work. That's why they're doing five, six courses of rifaximin or herbals and things like that. And we're going to look at the second part. So we did the, the kill it. We went through the like why killing it doesn't work. And now we're going to look at starving it, why starving it doesn't work. So so let me know. Let me know you're here. Let me know if you saw that first part. Let me know if you're tuning in because this is the second part of it. We don't have Joanna on camera today, but she is behind the camera and she is working really hard. So say hello, Joanna. Hello. I think you should have been able to hear her. So she's still there. So if you want to say hello, say hello and let her know that you're here as well. Really appreciate that because we really like being able to connect with you. It's, it's really nice. So as you're coming along, let us know you're here. So the, the the first part of this was trying to trying to help you understand why killing killing a dysbiosis or killing like a SIBO or an overgrowth doesn't work, and this is because these are almost always almost unanimously downstream problems of something going on further upstream. And unless you address this upstream thing down up here, the downstream thing, even if you try and fix it, the problem is still occurring. So SIBO or Candida are sort of adaptive responses or they're symptoms. These are these are downstream issues where we don't see resolution and, and real true healing until we address the root cause. Just going in and killing the, the dysbiosis doesn't work. I talked a little bit about the five pillars. So the five pillars is one of the courses that I have in the academy. It's a concept that I, that I developed through my own experience of trying to basically kill these kinds of dysbiosis. I, did anti I literally did the antibiotics, I did metronidazole and rifaximin, and then I did every single, every single herbal protocol under the sun you could imagine. I did neem, I did oregano, I did grape seed, grapefruit seed oil, I did, oh, th that neem stuff was horrible. I bought my own neem oil and put it into capsules myself and it would make me gag every time I ate, it was horrible. So I've tried, I've tried every herbal protocol under the sun, I know it doesn't work. So if, if you can relate to this and you're like, I've tried the herbal protocol, I know it doesn't work, then this is really good information for you, you're gonna like this. First of all, go and check out the first part. No, first of all, watch this, then go and check out that first part. But I'll, I'll summarize what we said in that. So it's all about the five pillars. The five pillars are the five primary functions of the human digestive system. You've got stomach acid, digestive enzymes, bile, motility, and mucosa. These five things, if you've got a gut problem, it's almost always, so I would say, I don't actually know a single person that I've, that I've worked with, that I've spoken to, that doesn't have an issue with one of these five things. It's always one of these five things. So making sure that these five things are as supported as possible is, is crucial. These are, these are sort of the things that really go wrong. The root cause is usually impacting one of these things. And if we, if we do herbals and things like that, but we haven't addressed these five pillars, you're going to struggle. But that's sort of like the kill it, and these five pillars do a lot of killing. But, then we're gonna, but now we're going to talk about the starve it, like the starve it part. So um, a lot of people either like go carnivore, they go like the whole way, they're like, okay, these organisms live on, live on plants, on fiber, on these kinds of things, on sugars, just cut it all out. And sure, some people get great symptom relief when they're on this, but then say they eat a plant again, they basically die. And I can relate because I made the very same mistake. I went completely carnivore. It's very difficult to begin reintroducing foods again after you do that because it, it's, it's not good. So if, you, if we can avoid doing this, it avoids problems in the long run because it's a tricky situation to get out of. If we, don't, if we can't starve it, then, then what do we do? Well, your diet needs to be optimized for you. And this is, this is the tricky part because everybody has a different optimal diet. This is why, so I, I, this is why I made a course in the Health Potion Academy called How to Build a Healthy Diet for You because everybody's different. There are some, there are some core features that are gonna be the same regardless of the diet. So nutrient density is, is important. High bioavailability, bioavailability of those nutrients, also very important. Having the food as pre-digested as possible, very important. And making sure that they are, they have a full array of all of these different diverse array of nutrients that we need, very important. There's, there's other beneficial things that we can include. So making sure you've got a lot of, a lot of antioxidants, that's, that's not really gonna hurt, that's only really gonna help. 
um, and supporting like things to support the microbiome. So making sure the diet is supporting the microbiome to healing in the long run is also really going to help. That's going to be a common theme of all of these healing diets. But it's very individualized. And while the things that I just mentioned make up the 80%, that 20% for everybody is going to be completely different. Everybody has different sensitivities to different things for different reasons. Everybody needs different microbiome support because their microbiome is different because they took different antibiotics, they've been exposed to different chemicals. It's different. Everybody's different. This is one reason one-to-one -one coaching is so common. You're never going to be able to starve a dysbiosis. The thing is, even if you fast, even if you eat absolutely nothing, you're fasting, juice fast or like literally water fast, even a dry fast, you eat nothing. Your lymphatic system all drains into your digestive system. Yeah, some of it goes through your kidneys and you feel waste out that way. All of it is, is basically coming into your gut. You've got lymphatic nodes all the way through your gut, like all the way through the small intestine, they're called payers patches. This is like the seat of your immune system and all of your lymphatic fluid drains into the gut. So even if you're eating nothing, your lymphatic system is still draining into the gut. Full of toxins, this lymphatic fluid has polysaccharides in, your gut mucin, your membrane in your gut is made of polysaccharides. All of these things are fuel, these are food for dysbiosis. And this is why even if people are fasting, they can still have gas and they can still feel bloated. It's because these things are still living. They're still, these organisms are still alive. They're still reproducing. You're, you, you cannot starve these organisms, it's, it's impossible. So eating a super restrictive diet in an attempt to starve these things doesn't work. The, the, the most important premise of the diet is that it is completely nutritionally like nutritionally complete it's it's fueling your body and your immune system you only get on top of these problems if your immune system becomes strong again healing comes from within you if you strengthen these five pillars if you and again doing that requires lots of nutrients like you can't produce stomach acid without zinc you can't make enzymes if you don't have a good enzyme capacity strong metabolism all of the different cofactors that are required Every single enzyme is made out of a protein. So if you don't have enough protein, you're going to struggle to make enzymes. All of these are very important. Bile, made out of things like choline and cholesterol and all these different things. If you don't have enough of these, you're not going to be able to, to make bile. So you need all of these ingredients. Matt says, I did a low FODMAP diet for about four years and it didn't really benefit my dysbiosis. My IPA, IBS didn't improve one bit. And this is, this is very common. Doing very restrictive diets, it's not solving the problem. We're going to talk about what we do in a, in a minute, but just eliminating foods isn't, it, it shouldn't be the focus. Sure, okay, no, so I'll, I'll tell you what we do. We do want to eliminate some foods. The thing is, we're eliminating foods that we can't digest. Your diet is designed, like the primary function, yeah, I know, eating's nice, we like the taste, we like the texture, it's pleasurable, but ultimately, like, let's go down to the core of it, like, get rid of all of the fluff and all the unnecessary things, like, at its essence, why do we eat food? We eat food to nourish our body, so that's mic micronutrients and macronutrients, and it has a huge effect on our microbiome. So we're, we're eating for health, that's, that's ultimately the essence of it, so that we can be healthy. So if you eat a food, and it actually, first of all, it doesn't provide macronutrients to you, either because you can't break them down and you can't digest them. It doesn't provide micronutrients, again, because you can't break them down because you can't digest them, or because they're not a good fuel source say like a good example is like a conventionally grown apple like they're full of sugar they've got no micronutrients in whatsoever because the soils are completely depleted if you've eat, if you've had the difference of eating like an organic or a wild apple compared to um like an apple that you, that you buy in the store that's conventionally grown with pesticides and stuff one just tastes like a sugar bomb and that's it all you taste is the sugar and the other one tastes like an apple and it's like wow there's a huge difference there and this is the micronutrients but even more than that it's can we actually digest these foods? So yeah, you might be able to get a really healthy apple that's organic and it's, it's, it's grown in the wild, but if your gut has lost the ability to break those food, to break that down, absorb it and get nutrients from it, it's not worth eating because you're not gaining any strength from it. Everything you put in your mouth makes you strong, but it makes you weak. And my approach to this is only putting the things in your mouth that make you strong. So this, the best example of this I can use is starch because it's such a, like when I explain it to you, it's such an obvious thing and it makes so much sense. And I really understand the physiology of this part of the problem. So we'll go with starch for, for this. But this model that I'm applying to you to this, you can also apply to any other molecule that you're trying to digest and you, you can't actually absorb anything from it. You can't get nutrients from it. But it's especially true with starch because 
when starch doesn't digest properly, not only does it not provide you nutrition, it also makes dysbiosis worse. So this is why this one's so interesting. So starch has a complex digestive process. So first of all, you can think of a starch molecule like a caterpillar. It's a really good analogy because it's got lots of different segments of its body, like loads of different segments, and each segment on its body has two little legs sticking out of it. So you can imagine this huge, this huge chain of two little legs sticking out like this. So the first enzyme that, that breaks this down is amylase. So amylase, you can imagine it breaks this huge chain into just single little bits. So you've got like a single segment of the body with one leg on each side. So you've got two legs in total, but these two legs are joined. So that's amylase. Amylase secreted from our mouth. So when we chew, this is why it's really important to chew carbohydrates. And this is also why as you chew carbohydrates, especially ones that don't taste sweet. So imagine like a potato, you're chewing a potato, it doesn't taste sweet, but as you chew it and keep it in your mouth and keep chewing it, the amylase is working and it starts breaking these starch molecules into single or, or disaccharide sugar molecules, which actually taste sweet. So if you chew a carbohydrate for long enough, it'll actually start to taste sweet in your mouth and that's because you're breaking it down in your mouth. But then it gets to your stomach and the pH changes. This amylase is working between pH seven and eight which is about what, what it is in your mouth. But then as it gets to your stomach, it drops to three or below, it is what it should drop to if you've got strong enough stomach acid. Should drop to three and below. So at this point, not only is amylase ineffective, not only does it stop working, it's actually destroyed. So not only does the digestion of starch pause, it's, it's completely stopped, it's, it's canceled. All of the amylase that you've secreted is destroyed. The, 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 the HCL is so strong it destroys it. So then, after you've finished eating and your stomach's like, okay, all of this is broken down now, it's liquefied, we've broken down all the protein, it releases it into the small intestine. And at this point, amylase digestion can continue. So breaking the starch down into those disaccharide sugars can continue because the pancreas secretes some more amylase. So then we can start breaking that down even more. But to break it, when it gets broken down from amylase, it becomes maltose. So maltose is a disaccharide sugar. So it's like, imagine one of the, one of the segments of the caterpillar's body, but with two legs. So it's still got two sugars, and we can't break it down until it's just one sugar on its own. They have to be separated. They can't be joined together like this. So you can imagine like the legs of the caterpillar like this. So we need to break it down to one leg. So this second stage requires a brush border enzyme called maltase. So this is so basically any anything that ends in A's is usually an enzyme. So maltase breaks down maltose. Quite simple. Quite easy to understand. It's a bit more complicated with like amylase breaking down starch, but with this one it's really easy. Same can be applied to, think, um, lactose. Lactose is broken down by, can you guess? Give me a guess. Write, write, the name of, write the name of the enzyme that breaks down lactose after what I've just told you. Tell me if you know what it is. We'll see who gets it right. So this, this enzyme is now, it should be what breaks the maltose down into the, the monosaccharide sugar. And this is what it needs to get to so that we can absorb it. If this enzyme isn't present and this is almost always the case if your gut is damaged because it's a brush border enzyme. So we've got our intestines that look like this and they've got these little villi on it. And on top of these, we've got loads of different brush border enzymes. Side note, this is also where DAO is made. So if you've got histamine problems and you've got low DAO, you're also gonna be struggling with this. So these can look like this, they can only be this big or they can be completely flat. Or even if they're here, the surface can be damaged and not have as much of these enzymes present as it should. So we got We've got Tara in on Instagram, she says lactase, spot on. And we've got Matt on Facebook, he says lactase, spot on. Good job guys, you, you got it, so you, you get it. So say we don't have lactase or maltase present on our brush border enzymes, we eat these foods and we just can't break them down. We don't have the enzyme and we can only absorb these sugars when they're a single monosaccharide sugar. So instead of being digested, they ferment. If you've got um, a dysbiosis or an overgrowth or anything like that, these are things are now eating these, these foods that we haven't been able to digest. This is one reason things like the elemental diet actually work. So the, the elemental, elemental diet doesn't always work because it's not always addressing, as, as I've said before, the five pillars. You have to make sure the five pillars are covered as well. But what the elemental diet is doing is making it so that the, the food that you're trying to, to digest is already as pre-digested as possible got a question here. Which foods do we chew a lot for benefits aside from starch carbs? So really, for the most part, it is just it is just starch carbs because 
all the other foods that we eat, they're going to be broken down. They, if you've got strong enough acid, before anything leaves your stomach, it should literally be a liquid. It should be completely a liquid. So chewing can help because it allows the stomach acid to have more surface area to act on anything you're eating. For the most part, starch really is the most important thing because we need to break, make sure that's already broken down before it hits our stomach. So we need to focus on eating a diet that's actually nourishing us and that we actually have the capacity to digest. So you could apply the same thing to fat. Say you eat loads of fat, and I'm, I'm a proponent of a high fat diet because fat is important. Fat is where you get fat soluble nutrients. Fat stimulates the secretion of bile, which without bile, you don't have soap that's cleaning your intestines. You're not removing fat soluble toxins. So it's really important. It's important to eat a lot of fat. But if you eat more fat than you have the ability to digest, can can feed organisms. This is this is where it gets tricky because I know a lot of people have a tendency to say, oh, I've got this overgrowth, so I need to not eat this food. Like, for example, there's a lady that I'm speaking with, looking forward to working with her, she's just getting her fun sorted. Um, and she's got like a bacteroides problem. And it's, it's established that bacteroides can feed on protein and fats. So the problem here then becomes, okay, well, I've done a low carb diet and now my bacteroides have overgrown. What, what do I do now? The, the thing is, if you're eating food that you're not digesting properly, it's always going to feed something. It doesn't matter what it is, you're going to continue to have an overgrowth because your body is employing these organisms to break this food down for you so it doesn't putrefy and make you really sick. Your body is, is, is doing this. It's, it's employing these microbes to do a job. So until you get to a point where you're actually, you've supported the five pillars. So again, these things are, they, they play one role in killing organisms that shouldn't be there. So that's really important. Again, stomach acid, digestive enzymes, bile, motility, mucosa. And they, they play a second role. Each single thing that I've mentioned here, they all play a role in breaking your food down and allowing you to digest and absorb it. So if they're not present, they're not doing their killing role and they're not doing the digestion role. So you're, kill, you're not killing organisms that shouldn't be there and you're not digesting food, which feeds organisms that shouldn't be there. So it's a double pronged problem. But that's why the five pillars is so brilliant because it tackles both of those issues at the same time. And I mean, this, this is why I did it this way. Why overcomplicate it and make it unnecessarily complex when you can simplify it down? I've got this really good saying, simplicity is the highest form of sophistication. It's like, I've just simplified this concept down into five pillars. So those five pillars out, it, it, it covers both of these bases. And these, both of these bases are the reason for overgrowth and things like this. Dom says, you were talking about the elemental diet. So, elemental diet, think about it. Elemental is essentially the smallest kind of molecule that you can get. It's like broken down to its individual pieces. Like, so for example, no starch is in the elemental diet because it's a big chain. Any, any sugars that you have are, are dextrose. So a lot of elemental diet formulas have dextrose in. What is dextrose? Dextrose is a single molecule of sugar. It's not, it's not a disaccharide, it's not a big starch, which is a big chain of them, it's one molecule. So what they're doing on that diet is trying to make it so that everything that's eaten is absorbed immediately. And that's why it works, because it, it's, not st it's not so much that it's starving these organisms. It is, but that's not what they're trying to do with it. What they're trying to do with it is nourish the body so the five pillars come back online. Because remember, your body's smart, we only support the five pillars temporarily with things like supplements, HCL, bile, coffee enemas, juicing, whatever it is. We do these things temporarily to support the five pillars while until they come, they can come back online by themselves. And then, say for example with the starch, the gut heals. You've got amylase, so you can break it down. The gut lining has got um, maltase on all of the brush border enzymes, so you can break the foods down. There's no reason for the organisms to be overgrowing in the small intestine, so they go away. And even if they're like, even if we don't look at it from that model of the body employs the organisms to digest the food, there's still no food there for them to eat. And the natural cleansing mechanisms have been restored. We've got good acid, bile, motility, mucosa, and enzymes. They're, they're all back. So problem goes away by itself. So that's why that can work even when they don't use herbals and things. Ultimately, the essence of the elemental diet is eating a diet that is as pre-digested as possible. But you don't have to go that extreme. You don't have to use an elemental diet. Again, because elemental diet it's so far from nature, it's like a packaged product. You don't wanna be eating anything that's in a packet. Your body doesn't know what stuff in a packet is. You wanna be eating as close to nature as possible. 
So again, like organic, your body doesn't like glyphosate, it's an antibiotic, it's toxic, you don't want these kinds of things. You want to eat as close to a natural diet as possible. And I say natural diet, everyone's like, oh, what's a natural diet? If you're interested in this, there's also a course in the academy, how to build a, a diet for me. But in that course, I go over what every ancestral culture on the planet would have as core proponents of the diet. So I have to see if I can remember it all off the top of my head. Um, so there's organ meats. I know some people can't do organ meats, histamine problems, whatever it is. There's always a way around it. There's always something we can find. Either you can do broth with full, like with fish, or you can do egg yolks, or getting some kind of organ meat is important because it's about nutrient density. What we do is we find where we can get as much nutrient density as possible, and then we make it as bioavailable as possible. We cook the food, or we prepare the food in such a way where the body has to do as little work as possible. The five pillars have to work as little as possible to do this. And this means you, you, you become nourished and you get nutrients and it, and it strengthens the five pillars. And then you can handle food prepared in a different kind of way. It builds up slowly. They also have something cooked and something raw in their diet. So cooked, not really a problem. For the most part, anybody that's watching this that I've said go and eat some meat or some animal products is going to eat it cooked. So there you go. That's covered. That's fine. Not an issue. Raw. Raw can be difficult because fiber is just absolutely abrasive it is destructive to your gut it is so it's so rough it's 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 abrasive it's like sandpaper it's really hard on a, on a especially on a sensitive gut i know some of you watching this know exactly what i mean so that can be a problem but also plants have anti-nutrients in and when your gut is in a damaged state you can't always handle these things oxalate salicylate phytates lectins there's so many different molecules that can make plants difficult to digest so First of all, we can just get rid of fiber like that just by juicing. So we juice, sorted, we've got rid of the fiber. Fiber's not a problem anymore. And then we can just adjust the juice and build the juice around which foods you have sensitivities to. So if you've got salicylate problems, eat vegetables that juice vegetables low in salicylate. If you've got oxalate problems, juice vegetables low in oxalate. Interestingly, might be might be interesting to some of you, kale isn't actually that high in oxalate. I was doing some research. And it's actually 10 times less oxalate in kale than in spinach. So I thought some of you might find that interesting because kale gets kind of demonized as being high in oxalate. Not really that high when you look at it compared to things like spinach. So you might find that interesting. So we build a diet that doesn't cause, doesn't cause extra symptoms and it's, and it's as pre-digested as possible. So again, vegetables, we're trying to get that raw component. If we do juicing, we're getting all the enzymes, we're getting all of the nutrients, a lot of a lot of nutrients are sensitive to, to heat, to temperature, and this is why having a raw component in your diet is important, because then you get access to all of these things. I do raw egg yolks as well, so even if you wanted to go carnivore, you can still get a raw element. I've, I've had like 10,000 raw egg yolks, never been sick, over like five or six years. It's fine. That, that thing, I don't know. I don't know where that came from. I've never had an issue with that. So combining like raw egg yolks, raw juice, you really cover that base. And then finally, the fourth thing that all ancestral um, societies have is some form of fermented food. And I know fermented foods are not possible for everybody. Histamine issues or extreme Herxheimer reactions, not possible for everyone, but we can kind of, we can sometimes, using a supplement here is okay sometimes. Initially, like in the initial stages at least. So we can use a probiotic, and that way we can cover the, the primary aspects of fermented food. There's also other ways we can prepare fermented foods that make them way more tolerable. But making sure that we have those four bases covered are essential because there's not one, there's not a single like ancestral culture on the planet. There isn't a single one. There are no vegan cultures, that not a thing. So if you're thinking I can do this on vegan, no one, no culture has survived as a vegan. It's, it's not possible. Um, I know we've got like access to different supplements and things like that, but why would you want to pull yourself so far away from what we've traditionally done? I get it. We don't like the animals dying, but Death is part of life, and I've got a whole article on veganism, so I don't really want to go down that here. To summarize, every single culture that has, that has survived on this planet has organ meats of some sort. Generally, they eat nose to tail, but that definitely means that they have organ meats. So if you can find a way to do that, you're on the right track. They have some cooked and some raw food, and they also have some kind of fermented food. So if you cover those four bases, you're pretty much going in the right direction. If you're missing one of those things, that could be a problem. We, we need to cover those bases, but make it so that it's as digestible for you as possible. So again, juicing, removing the fiber, picking the right vegetables, making sure that the organ meats you can actually digest, and 
If you've got each of these four things, even if it's one food in each category, so you've got one organ meat that you can tolerate, you've got, so egg yolks, you've got one vegetable that you can tolerate juice, raw, so could be, so for me, it's kale, that's the one I do great with. If you've got one kind of cooked food that you can do, that could either be, like say you, you tolerate kale well, cooked, great kale, or say you, you want to cook your egg yolks as well, or you've got beef or some other kind of thing you can eat, great, cover that, and then fermented food. If you can do a probiotic and you're working on your probiotic and eventually we can do other things with the microbiome, you need help with that, you let me know. I actually got a course coming out in the academy soon. I've got a lot of courses coming out in the academy soon, but Jesus is a lot of work. Um, about how to introduce foods like gradually with minimal reactions and how to, how to tell which food to introduce at, at which time. It can be really tricky. That's definitely something that works better on a more personalized level, but I can still give you the information and you can model for it, it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a tricky one. Eat food that you can digest, that is that is key. If you're, if you're eating food that you can't digest, first of all, you're not digesting it, so you're not getting any nutrients out of it. But secondly, and this is, this is the worst part, and this is especially, this is the part that I wanted to tell you about starch. When we don't digest these foods, the organisms in our gut eat them instead. And as a result, they produce lots of different things. These things irritate the gut lining, they increase the permeability, we absorb these things, they put a burden on the body. So instead of your food nourishing you and making you strong, it's actually making you sick because not only have you not extracted anything from it, you've actually put more work on your body because now you've got this stream of endotoxins coming in from your gut that your liver has to then handle with. That congests the, the bile pillar, it suppresses your stomach acid production, and it, it weakens you. So this is why so many people struggle for such a long time is they continue eating foods they're not able to digest. Focus on eating foods that you can actually extract nutrients from and build your body from the ground up. It can take some time. If like me, if, if you're like me and you've had every single one of these five pillars fail, acid failed, enzymes failed, bile failed, motility failed, mucosa failed. I, I literally was flawed. All of these were broken. I had to pick every single one up at the same time and support them all at the same time. That's tricky. That's really hard to do, but I'm a living testament that it's possible. I'm still not 100%. Like I said, you break all these five pillars at the same time, it's gonna take you some time to recover from, but it's definitely possible, especially with the right approach. So I hope you found that informative. If you need any help from me, just let me know. If you're interested in, the, in more information about the five pillars, just let me know as well. I'll send you some information over. So I really hope you found that informative. That was, that was the second part in the Kill It Starve It model. Hope you understand how to actually build a diet that's not just focused on, oh, let's just starve the dysbiosis. It's about nourishing you. It's about making you strong, making your immune system strong. And that, that's how you really get over these, these chronic gut issues and chronic health issues that are connected to them. So really hope you found that helpful and I'll see you guys very soon. Bye-bye.